Chances are you clicked this video because you're curious about getting a credit card at 18 or even just your first card in general. Or maybe you just really enjoy learning about credit cards, which is totally fine too, because not only am I gonna give specific recommended cards as far as getting a credit card at 18, but on top of that, I'm gonna give some general advice and tips when it comes to credit cards and how to use it. Now, the first tip I like to give everybody out there is to basically understand the inherent risks involved with getting a credit card. You know, basically everybody out there that gets a credit card thinks they're outsmarting the credit card companies. And yet these credit card companies are making billions in profits every single year. So there's a good chance that the people that the credit card companies are benefiting from and profiting from, that they originally started off thinking that they were gonna outsmart the credit card companies and that they weren't gonna pay any fees or interest to, towards those credit card companies. No one opens a credit card thinking that they're gonna make late payments or that they're gonna end up overspending. So what I like to think is that by recognizing this fact that you are susceptible to mistakes, then at least you're more alert to it and then therefore less likely to make those mistakes. So now to really get into the information on how to get a credit card at 18 and I'm going to talk about a few different options but let's start with just getting a normal credit card if you're somebody who's 18 years or older but is still under 21 years old you're probably going to need some good form of proof of income and it doesn't have to be a significant amount of income it can be you know a low amount of income what's more important here is having a stable form of income and getting consistent payments throughout you know a yearly basis rather than the level of income you're getting. That's more likely to affect the overall credit limit that you end up being approved for, rather than actually getting approved for a credit card. You know, it still does have an impact on if you get paid a significant amount or not, on whether or not you get approved for the credit card. But I just want people to really understand out there that you still can get approved for a credit card, even though you have low income. Now, another option that I do see out there that's not necessarily talked about too often because only a few banks really allow it, I believe US Bank is an option, is to co-sign with someone for a credit card. And that's a lot different than an authorized user, but it's not really an option I would highly recommend. But it certainly is an option, so I at least wanted to mention it. Speaking of which, being an authorized user on someone else's credit card account is definitely a great option too. In fact, you can even become an authorized user for certain credit cards before you even turn 18, and that can have huge advantages. For example, before you even turn 18, some credit card companies out there will use, as far as how they're using your credit scores, they will use your average length of history and include whether or not you've been an authorized user. So in theory, by the time you actually turn 18 years old, you already have a pretty good credit score as far as some calculations, as far as some credit scores, how they calculate it. It doesn't necessarily always apply across the board, but it definitely can help you get approved for certain credit cards. In fact, I remember when I applied for my first credit card that I was notified that one of the reasons I had such a high credit score and one of the reasons why I got approved was because I had this average credit history of approximately about 10 years, but the reason was is because I was an authorized user on someone else's account that had that credit card for 10 years. Now, whether or not you end up being an authorized user or you end up going that co-sign route as far as getting your first credit card, it's really important for you to understand who is ultimately on the hook for that payment or that statement amount. For example, if you're an authorized user on someone else's account, then in that case, even if, you, you know, for example, if you have some kind of agreement that you're on your parents' account and, you know, you're an authorized user on your parents' account, ultimately your parent is responsible for paying that amount. So that's really important for both people to understand because if my parent is relying on me to give them cash, for example, or write them a check for the statement amount, and I don't end up doing that, they have to understand that they're still on the hook for that amount and that if I don't end up paying it, it could impact their credit score. If you do end up choosing to go the cosign route as far as having a credit card, then you have to understand that you're both liable as far as that debt or amount that you have to pay on that statement. So for example, if you had some kind of agreement with your parent and they end up co-signing a credit card for you and they agree to pay half of the credit card bill, but for one reason or another, they end up deciding that they're not necessarily gonna pay half. Well, you're still on the hook for that amount and they are too as well, so it kind of can end up playing both ways, but it's really important for you to understand who ultimately is on the hook for that statement amount. Now, a common theme I find with people getting their first credit card, or especially if you're young and getting your first credit card, is they really wanna make sure what is the best starter credit card to get, what's the first beginner card credit card that they should end up getting. And what I would say here, which is actually kind of contrary to a lot of what other people say, is to not necessarily worry so much about it. Personally, what I would say here is that the overall goal as far as getting your first credit card is to first start building credit, you know, your credit report and building up your credit score. And on top of that, just familiarizing yourself with good financial habits as far as making sure you set up auto pay and different things as far as credit cards, not necessarily to worry about different sign up bonuses 
or worry about getting one or two percent cash back on a certain credit card. And part of the reason I also say this is because there's a good chance if you're getting your first credit card, especially at a young age, is that one or half a percent difference is not necessarily going to be a big deal to you. For example, if you end up spending a thousand dollars throughout the course of a year, then a half a percent difference only ends up being about five dollars. Now, I will still give my own general recommendation as far as cards that I would go for if I was, you know, getting my first credit card at 18. But once again, this is just my personal opinion. You have to keep in mind that I have the general outlook of I'm just trying to keep things as simple as possible and kind of get introduced to the whole entire game. So what I would personally recommend is to start with just a basic either Chase card or American Express card. The Discover It 8 card is another option. I do think it has its benefits, but there are two reasons why I would at least suggest going with Chase or American Express. Now with American Express, it can be a little bit difficult as far as if you have a low credit score to get approved for them. But if you can get approved with them as far as a starter card, I would definitely go with something like the American Express Everyday card. Or, you know, if you end up going the Chase route, then something like the Chase Unlimited or the Chase Flex card that everybody's talking about right now, you know, those are certainly great options as far as a starter card. Now, the first reason why I generally recommend these cards is because in the end, if you end up kind of looking more into credit card reward points and you want to get more into that game and that kind of gets you excited, then the ultimate end goal usually is to revolve around Chase and American Express. And so I kind of think if that's gonna end up being the end goal anyways, then you might as well start getting familiarized with you know, how their online website works or you know, how the whole entire um, application process ends up working for American Express and Chase. So that's kind of my reasoning as far as why I would think someone that's getting their first credit card should go with American Express or Chase first, as opposed to the Discover It Ed card. But like I said, that certainly is an option. Now, the other general reason that I recommend either going with Chase or American Express and getting their starter or basic cards first is, you know, this may be a little bit biased, is that in my experience, I have always had great relationships with them. I've always had great customer service with them. If I had ever had any issue, I could call them up and they were very responsive or American Express is great with their online chat. I don't even necessarily have to talk to anybody on the phone. I can just type it while I'm at work or while, you know, while I'm in school or something like that. And so you can just end up typing, asking them questions, asking them to send a replacement card or whatever it is. It's very easy to navigate and they have great customer service. And I think a lot of people would attest to that as well. So. That would be my recommendation, especially since it's your first card, you may have a lot of questions or you may have a lot of issues getting stuff started. So you really wanna make sure you have that customer service to kind of be on your side and help support you. And to kind of give a good example of this, and once again, this is not even just my experience, but plenty of other people's experiences, with American Express and Chase, you know, if you end up having to get a replacement card and you're gonna go, go on a trip fairly soon, they will end up rushing it out to you for free, sometimes even overnighting that card. Or in American Express's case, they end up waiving, and even in Chase's case too, they end up waiving late fees or even interest fees as far as if you end up having a late payment, which I really hope, you know, that doesn't end up happening to anybody, but that certainly is an option is calling them up, you know, apologizing. Hopefully you've had a few payments where you did make it on time. So that that way they can kind of build credibility that's never going to happen again and they may end up waiving that late fee so that's a good example of how that great customer service ends up actually paying off now at the end of the day if you can't end up qualifying for a regular credit card either becoming an authorized user on someone else's credit card account or if you can't end up co-signing for a credit card and there's basically no other option at this point then your next best option is to get a secured credit card. And basically all a secured credit card really means is, whereas a credit card or normal credit card, you could end up spending $1,000. And if I really wanted to, I could just walk away and not end up paying it. And they're gonna end up sending that to collections and sure that's gonna hurt my credit score. But that's different than a secured credit card where you're actually putting up money as collateral. So for example, with a secured credit card, let's say I put $1,000 into an account they basically are using that thousand dollars as collateral. So if I end up spending five hundred dollars on my, you know, secured credit card, and I don't end up paying that five hundred dollars back, well, they already have my thousand dollars there, so they're just going to take it out of that. So that's kind of how a secured credit card ends up working. And I also want to point out too that secured credit cards are not even just a great option for somebody getting their first credit card, but they're also a great option for people that are trying to repair their credit score. So for example, if I end up, or if you end up messing up your credit score, then looking into secured credit cards is certainly a great option. And what I would generally recommend as far as 
which secured credit card to go with is a Capital One secured card. And you know, there's plenty of options out there. Certainly you can look into it if you want. But once again, my general recommendation here is to not necessarily stress about the details too much. I think a lot of people get, you know, Caught, kind of caught into certain you know stipulations or certain rules as far as how does this secured credit card or you know compares to a different one but at the end of the day you're just trying to keep the process as simple as possible and you're trying to help build that credit profile so that way you can have a better credit score and kind of get introduced to the whole rewards and credit card game now before i move any further into other tips i did just want to mention for anybody that's out there that's young or is in college to definitely be extra alert to people trying to basically disguise credit cards into something else so for example i remember when i was in college that they basically had some kind of payment card or college card or something like that and they didn't necessarily describe it as a credit card and they almost end up making it seem like it's something you have to sign up for as a student at this university or college and you know there's a lot of people who do end up signing up for that exact reason they think it's something that's just kind of part of the college experience you know so i think a lot of people at that age are tend to be pretty vulnerable so just definitely be alert for those different things the same thing happens at stores all the time you can go into a store or retail store to buy some clothing and they will basically say hey do you want to sign up for this rewards program and sometimes it is just a true rewards program where you just give an email and have an account but in some cases they basically disguise it as a rewards program but really you're actually signing up for a credit score or a credit card so definitely be on alert for that now as far as some general tips as far as what to do once you actually have your first credit card or even secured credit card is to set up auto pay immediately just get in the habit of that and sometimes when you're activating the credit card you can actually set up auto pay immediately and I really think that's a great option that you have to kind of get into the habit of. And I can actually speak from experience that there's been plenty of times where I end up telling myself, well, I want to activate it right now, but for whatever reason, maybe, you know, probably out of laziness, to be honest, I just end up telling myself, I'm going to set up auto pay later on. And what ends up happening is I kind of end up having this panic attack sometime down the road and end up kind of freaking out and worrying, oh, did I miss the payment? Did I miss, you know, the actual due date for the amount that I owe? And, you know, sure enough, it ends up just being like three or four days, you know, right before I actually have to pay it. So it ends up still working out, you know, luckily, but it obviously could have worked out, you know, for pretty poorly for me if I didn't end up paying that amount. So at the end of the day, what I recommend is just set up auto pay. Don't be lazy about it and just do it right away. It's only gonna take you a few seconds anyways. And on top of that, if you need any more incentive to it, you know, if it ends up taking you just like 30 seconds or even just five minutes to set up auto pay, but yeah, you don't do it, it can end up costing you not even just the interest on the statement amount, but you, they're gonna hit you with late fees, they may increase your interest rate that you're being charged, and it could impact your credit score. So there's a lot of negatives and drawbacks rather than you just compare that to just, you know, spending five times, five minutes to set up that auto pay. It's definitely worth doing. So I'm actually gonna go out and say that it's actually worth taking a step further than auto pay and to actually review the credit card statements that come in as far as the different charges that hit your, you know, same credit card. And just to get in that habit, just for the first few months, maybe three months or six months, just so you can be aware of how the whole process works as far as, you know, the refunds coming in, whether you do any returns or all the payments that are going out, you know, just the different things. So that way you're aware of how it actually operates. And on top of that, I would also get in the habit just for the first few months, at least, to also look at the credit card balance and then make sure that you have those available funds in your bank account. Because I feel like that's an area that, especially a lot of college students or young you know, people in their, that are 18, that end up kind of making the mistake that they end up having the situation where their credit card balance is way more than what they have in their bank account. And so they end up either having to pay the interest on their credit card or they end up having, sometimes they're not even aware of it and the auto pay tries to pay it, but now you can end up hitting a fee from your bank account and sometimes a fee hitting from your credit card company too. So it's kind of like this double whammy type situation. So you really wanna make sure that you have those available funds and you wanna pay that credit card balance in full. And to kind of go along with that, if you don't pay your credit card in full, that's when you're really losing out and it's not helping your financial situation. Even just on $100, for example, if I carry a balance of $100, you know, these credit card companies have like on average, let's just say 25% interest rate. So, you know, you can end up losing $25 just on $100 if you end up letting that sit for a while. So, and you can end up even losing more because then it starts to build up more and more, right? Once you hit that $125 balance, 
now they're charging you interest on the full amount. So it can end up really, really hurting your financial situation. So really make sure you just get in the habit of paying that balance in full and making sure you have those available funds to pay it. And to kind of go along with all of this, I would say, you know, just look at a credit card as basically a glorified debit card, at least initially for the first year or two. You know, with the debit card, if I didn't have more than $50 in my bank account, I'm not necessarily gonna buy that $100 jacket that I can't afford you know, because I'm going to get hit with a fee from the bank account and most likely I'm going to accept the payment anyways. So look at a credit card that same way. If I don't have $50 or $100 in my bank account, then even though I have a credit card where I may not necessarily have to pay the $100 jacket for, you know, 30 days, don't look at it that way because then you end up getting those situations where you think a paycheck is coming in in a week or two and you think it's going to be a lot more than it ends up being. You, you end up getting paid a lot less even though you felt like you worked a lot harder. So, you know, then you end up being desperate for money. You end up having to, you know, pay the interest. You end up hit, getting hit with late fees or impacting your credit score. So don't end up looking that way. Just try to treat it as a debit card. So to start with the last two tips I want to give first, make sure you just continuously learn. You know, there's a lot of great resources out there as far as, you know, if you want to go online and look at Reddit, you know, there's a subreddit for credit cards as well as churning as far as, you know, rewards and different things like that. If that's what you're interested in, just learn before you actually get heavily involved don't dive in too quickly you know take your time or there's plenty of different youtube channels out there that are great i'm sure there's a few smaller different credit card channels that are going to comment down below you can check out those channels or you know one of my favorites is ask sebi you know that's definitely a bigger channel that um, has a lot of great points as far as different credit cards out there in the end all these different credit card channels end up having very similar information and they all end up you know having accurate information because they make sure of that so it just ends up being like which style or you know which personality you end up preferring and the very last tip i would give is to basically know your weaknesses and your vulnerabilities you know if i know that i can't necessarily deal with the temptation of having a credit card with a credit limit of thirty thousand dollars which actually is you know is not unheard of for somebody at 18 or you know at a young age getting approved for then it actually may be to my benefit to call that credit card company up and basically ask them to decrease my credit my credit limit which would impact your credit score and that's something to really understand but at the same time if i'm a person that i know is going to be very tempted to spend twenty thousand dollars on this credit card and end up not being able to afford to pay it back and then i get up hitting it with the interest fee you know the late fee ends up hurting my credit score because i can't ever pay it back and ends up getting sent to collections you you know, that's a way huger and bigger deal than, say, decreasing your credit um, credit limit, and that's going to end up hurting your credit score a few points. You know, so that's definitely what I mean as far as learning what your weaknesses are and making sure you take the steps to make sure that those weaknesses don't end up hurting you down the road. If you want to learn more about credit cards or personal finance, consider subscribing to the channel. And if you like business, economics, or any of those types of topics, consider subscribing as well because those are topics I enjoy talking about. And if you want to comment down below any questions you may have as far as different credit cards that you're interested in or different credit score questions that you're kind of confused about, feel free to comment down below and I do my best to answer those questions. And as always, I hope to see you in the next one.